event for those of you who are forum members and welcome to those guests of Elizabeth Linda and Broach Associates. My name is Simon and I'm just coming in here to introduce Elizabeth who's been a great friend to forum in the past and indeed was speaking with us only last Friday and she asked if she might put this program together uh, on uh, the economic future of uh, Azerbaijan and of course we're absolutely delighted that she's done that. I'm now going to hand you directly to Elizabeth who will uh, get stuck in with the three esteemed panelists that she's invited today. Elizabeth, I hand the baton to you. Wonderful, Simon. Well, thank you so very much and thank you for joining us today. This is such an absolutely fascinating time to take a closer look at Azerbaijan and today we do th so, th so through the lens, of course, of uh, the future of the economy, uh, the economic diversification that's taking place uh, in the country and we have uh, a lot to talk about uh, right now. About a decade ago, um, Azerbaijan was the fastest growing GDP in the world. And while that, of course, has leveled off, uh, we've seen a recent peace treaty uh, in the country. Uh, we are seeing a rapidly changing geopolitical environment that, of course, is impacting economies around the globe. And so, needless to say, there is a lot to talk about and a lot to learn from, uh, straight from the heart of Baku from where our panelists uh, join us today or have had previous extensive experience. And so it's a really, really, really great pleasure to welcome our panelists today. We are uh, joined by Mohlin, the group uh, head of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, Azerbaijan, uh, who's joining us from Baku. John Patterson, who is the head of the uh, British Business Group Azerbaijan, also joining us from Baku, and former Ambassador Robert Sakuda, who's former U.S. State Department Ambassador to Azerbaijan, who is joining us from his home in Maine. So thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us. And we're going to spend the next hour together really diving deeply into Azerbaijan and its uh, future uh, economic outlook, what's happening there, what's going on there, what's the insider's view. Uh, we'll spend the next hour together and we will have plenty of time for questions. As questions do arise and occur to you, please go ahead and make use of the chat feature, either to the group or individually to uh, myself or to Simon, so that we can begin to collect your questions as we go along. And as a very brief reminder, everything today is recorded and is entirely on the record. Uh, and so please treat everything you discuss as publicly shareable uh, information as we spread awareness and learn more about this fascinating geography and uh, business environment. So, Movlin, if I could begin with, with you, can you set the tone for us on the, the big picture? Uh, where has the economy come from the last few decades and really what's going on now and why are we needing to pay so much attention to Baku at the moment? Right, yes, thanks Elizabeth and thanks Simon for having me. So indeed, I mean, if there was one word I could describe what's going on in the country for the past few years, it's actually transformation. Um, and if you remember where Azerbaijan started uh, in the part of the Soviet Union, uh, actually, I, I lived through the, all these times and, and we've seen so many changes happening in the past uh, almost 30 years. So actually, in fact, I wouldn't go back too much to the past and I'd like to talk about what we're having at the moment. Um, so that transformation is still very much going on. Uh, yes, it's all up and downs, of course, with the hiccups, the challenges that we're facing. But the good thing is, it's been quite a consistent uh, progress that is happening. Maybe I'll, I mean, and these are, these are things that are happening in the, in the various areas. It's, a, it's, a, it's a social, in the governance, in efficiency of state-owned um, enterprises, environmental issues, and so on. So maybe just to give a bit of a context where, uh, where the country is heading uh, at, at, the, uh, at the moment is, 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 is basically what the president has highlighted several times in terms of the key principles that, um, that how the future economic, uh, the economic target model should look like. I know I'm talking like consultant at the moment, but <laughs> it's actually, <laughs> that's what we've been doing actually together with the government for many years. So, um, Number one priority is diversification of the economy. Um, that's actually has had its own challenges. 
we still very much depend on oil and gas naturally, uh, but we are seeing the non-GDP growth, it's already happening in the, in the economy. Um, so, and then the, the president specifically actually mentioned the areas where that non-oil and gas growth should come from. And I'll, I'll just name a few, uh, there are a little bit more than that. It's uh, telecoms, uh, together with obviously digitalization of the country. It's uh, transport and logistics, basically integrating Azerbaijan into global value chain. It's uh, tourism and it's uh, agriculture, yeah? So, these are, again, there are a little bit more than that, a couple more, but I focus on those ones which are probably have the biggest potential to develop um, and uh, where the currently actually the focus is, is on. Um, the, the, the second priority is developing the SMEs. Um, the Azerbaijan generally in the past really lacked a proper strong uh, middle class. And, and we, the, I think the government had realized several years ago that actually without creating that middle class, it would be very difficult to have a prosperous social welfare uh the country so that, that there's there's a lot of uh attention now how we're how going to be done uh there's more funding now available the startups are now being incentivized to 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 invest more and so on um third third is increase of uh, uh efficiency of soes azerbaijan is still very much dependent on um state-owned enterprises as the sort of engine of the economy of, of of growth of gdp employment taxes and and so on uh, so uh, the, the, it's, it's very imperative that we have the SOEs uh, operate efficiently with the proper KPIs. And the, the probably the, the, the most recent development in that area is creation of Azerbaijan investment holding. That is probably will be your one of the biggest uh, counterpart when it comes to reforms working together with SOEs. It's basically a sovereign wealth fund, which is which manages. 11 largest um, SOEs in the country. It's very new. They're still working on the, uh, the structure, the governance, the KPIs, but I think that's the, uh, probably one of the most important developments in that area in the, in the past few years. Uh, the, the, maybe a couple other things as well I mentioned. It's a, uh, the, the policy um, uh, has been uh, approved in terms of um, significant reduction of what they call is gray economy, cash economy in the past, and it's public knowledge. President talked about several times the, 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 the cash economy, uh, undeclared income, they were about 50 to 60 percent, depending on who, you, who you're talking to. Uh, the target is to have it within the next couple of years, uh, and, and, and there are a number of the, mayor, uh, the, 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 the measures that are being implemented, including using uh, the credit cards more tax rebates, refunds, and, and you name it. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the fifth priority is the enhancement of foreign investment legislation. Generally, there is very, uh, there's a lot of respect to uh, foreign investment contracts. I mean, differently from some of our neighbors mm -hmm. where the, the investment contracts signed, then in a few years after, the government start going after those companies uh, asking for more share in, in, the, in, the, in those contracts. That never happened in Azerbaijan. That's the fact. Yeah, uh, all the oil and gas contracts, what are called the production share agreements, they've been respected. Uh, the terms have not been renegotiated and there's been no push on uh, going back and renegotiating the terms. Um, the judicial reforms, it's, uh, uh, it, it's one of the, uh, probably the areas which are still require a lot of more efforts than the others uh but at least there is there is some push from the president going to uh, to, to 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 make it more efficient and more independent um and underpinning all of this is uh, probably two major um uh, two major things is political and social stability of the country um there's there's the quite there's consistent uh, policies around Foreign investment, liberalization. Um, the, uh, uh, we can see a quite strong support of the current government by the population. Yes, of course, it doesn't come without the challenges, and as we will probably talk about this a little later. Uh, but at least we've we've seen a very stable uh, political and economic um, the policies. Um, and the, the, the second one is actually improving the government government structure. Um, we can see with, in the last few years. Uh, what we call is the old school is going away. Old school are those sort of 
former Soviet directors, former Soviet bureaucrats that used to dominate in the political arena uh, and the business arena, unfortunately, for some time. Uh, for the past about four years, that's, that's going on. Sorry, that change is that's changing. Uh, the president is bringing a, a young uh, technocrats who are actually uh, not really, they have no uh, the party affiliation and, and they're really driving uh, these reforms. Okay, so I stop here, uh, Elizabeth, so if there is any more question, happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you for that tour de force. You've given us a lot to unpack um, through that uh, initial recap of the, of the six or seven broad themes you outlined there today. Let's go back to where you started, which is your singular word transformation. A lot of transformation, of course, from the economic perspective right now in the world, not only in, in emerging markets, but also uh, in, in other countries, is powered by this uh, ESG movement. How is it that we reframe the ways in which we press boardrooms and, and directors press companies to be more responsible. Um, Ambassador Sakuda, you've done a lot of thinking around the ESG landscape. Can you help us understand how it is that uh, environment, social uh, governance is playing a role in uh, Baku and in the Azerbaijan economy? Yeah, so I, think I, can, I think I can. I want to really sort of, you know, get into sort of the question so people can ping me later. But first of all, Elizabeth, thank you very much. It's good to see Mavuan again, John. Um, it's uh, virtual being back in Baku. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the tea and we don't have the other the, the sort of the camaraderie. Um, but I think the this question about sort of the pressures on boards now is important because you look at this in terms of what's going on with companies, um, certainly in Europe, but I think also now increasingly in the United States on the energy front. And there's a lot of concern about, okay, how do we look at um, the, the role of, of say a Chevron or a Shell or a BP in coming to terms with the need to take on greenhouse gases. Um, there's also been, and I was on the board of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative with, with, uh, with two people actually from Azerbaijan um, uh, before I became ambassador. And one of the things we talked about there was this question of transparency and this question of knowing what was going on and the question of government accountability. Azerbaijan has actually had a good record on that transparency. Um, the state oil, uh, the uh, SOFAS, the, the, the state oil fund, has really been um, exemplary in terms of the work that it did to disclose what was going on um, so that people could find out. And so there was a transparency in terms of, of that, of, that uh, uh, of those funds and where they were going, what was being used, how much they were growing. Um, the point though too I would make is that it's kind of interesting with Azerbaijan because really it was, you, uh, Elizabeth, we said at the beginning, you know, the fastest growing economy 10 years ago, oil was the reason. And it's actually through oil um, that I think the United States developed a good relationship with Azerbaijan. But it was also, and I want to pick up on something that Mofan just talked about, it was through the development of oil and the development of massive projects like the Southern Gas Corridor, which was a $40 billion project, one of the world's largest capital uh, projects, um, that, sh that not only um, helped Azerbaijan's development, but also cemented in place a sound environment for international companies to deal with Azerbaijan. What Mofalan said was really important. I've dealt with a number of countries uh, in my time. Uh, as we used to say, they have great rocks, but a lousy government. Um, you've, got, you know, you've got to not only have the geology, but you've got to have the ability as a board to know that if you make an investment in this country, you're going to be able, the rules are not going to you, they're not going to certainly change on you, that you can get your money out, that you can bring your money in. There's not going to be kind of silly hassles. Those silly hassles really turn a board, <clears throat> really turn a board off. And one of the points, which I think, and I used to have this conversation a lot when I was with people in Azerbaijan, they very much, and the leadership very much, I think, understood this. You know, an emer emerging markets are great. Um, the returns on emerging markets are really very high, or have been very high, higher than frankly, in industrialized economies and, and, and good places for people to look to invest. But they're competing with each other. Everyone is competing. And Azerbaijan's record in terms of what it did with the oil and gas industry gave it a good position from which to compete because it had major companies, ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP, um, others, 
uh, who were in there, um, countries, uh, Petronas, um, uh, who were in there and operating well and they established a good record. The other thing I want to say about Azerbaijan, which I think is important here, um, we've talked about Azerbaijan in terms of the connectivity with the West, and, but to build again further on a little bit of what Mavlan Mom just said, Azerbaijan has also undertaken a number of other big capital projects. Um, the construction of the port at Alat and the Baku Tbilisi Cars Railroad. These are really putting in place, these are making the Eurasia connections, the new Silk Road, the idea of a new Trans Caspian fiber optic cable. Um, this is building the interconnectivity. This is building uh, uh, a, um, a better environment for Azerbaijan and also really creating the idea of the new Silk Road, the new connections across Eurasia. One important thing though, is that these are being financed by Azerbaijan. So we're not running into the kinds of problems that we've talked about in some countries with some of the financing that's been with BRI, project, BRI projects. So I think, you know, in terms of, you come back to this point about, you know, how boards might be looking at these, these sorts of things. There's a lot of good fundamentals with Azerbaijan um, that would make it attractive, that would enable it to compete, that would enable it to attract foreign capital. So with that, I think I better be quiet. No, thank you so much. Well, in, in essence there, you're helping us to understand that while we're looking at uh, what we would describe as an emerging economy, we're also looking at a stable uh, environment in which to uh, grow your, your business. Um, if I could come over now to, to you, uh, John, and I believe that you've been uh, based in Azerbaijan uh, for a very long time now, a number, of, a number of decades. You've seen a lot of change through the years. Um, we talked a little bit, of course, about the, the decade ago uh, oil boom, but you've spoken to me a lot about the pressure that today's uh, traditional oil companies are on to move into different types of energy and the impact that that's going to have on Azerbaijan as a whole being potentially one of the biggest pioneers of future uh, innovation within the energy sector. You mentioned what a windy place uh, Azerbaijan can, can, can often be. Can you help us to describe uh, what's going on in terms of the pace of change that we're seeing from some of the big players in town in Baku and how that's going to impact uh, the future of the economic landscape? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity to, to to ramble on as I normally do, um, but the the major player um, in Azerbaijan for the last 25, almost 30 years has been BP, um, and of course they've uh, had a complete change from being an oil company to transitioning into an energy company. Um, so this is uh, something that is going to affect uh, Azerbaijan particularly because BP is the biggest producer of uh, carbon footprint in Azerbaijan um, currently uh, and, and it, it, it admits to it. So um, actually yesterday I hosted a uh, renewables webinar for um, uh, the British Embassy to British Business Group and, and we had the government speak and we had uh, BP speak as well. <coughs> so this whole thing with um, with the renewables uh, moving forward is going to create quite a large um, opportunity uh, because um, the wind energy in Azerbaijan is, is phenomenal. Um, you think of the, uh, the windiest place that you want to in the UK, well, it, it, Baku beats it um, pretty much every day of the year. I'm a very keen cyclist. Um, I hate the wind, um, but it makes me better. Um, however, I remember about uh, probably 12 years ago, a chap called Dan Matthews from Baker and McKenzie speaking about wind power and stating at the time that there's like 286 days of the year where wind power could be commercially generated. And that's 12 years ago. So things have moved forward. Everything has improved in that regard in terms of technology. But also at the same time, um, we're further south than the south of France. 
um, and fine. During the winter, you get a couple of months of not very nice weather, but for most of the year, the sun is shining and it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful, which helps with the, the, the tourism side of it, but also it blends in there with the, um, uh, uh, with the wind power and the solar power together and this whole renewables idea, which is, which is beginning to pick up pace. Um, all the legislation required to get the uh, renewables market moving forward is all sitting there in its draft stage. Um, and on top of that, with this um, return of the uh, liberated territories, which is about 20% of Azerbaijan um, land mass, not quite, but the uh, main um, part of the occupied or what the liberated territories, which you have to get used to calling them now, which is wonderful, is the fact that for the last 30 years, there's been zero investment in what is quite a, a mountainous or sunny region. And the opportunity to just come in with a clear canvas and just take the renewable mm -hmm. side of the business to create the solar powers, the solar farms, the wind farms. And I haven't even talked about the offshore wind, which is now being, um, uh, looked at as a feasibility study, but uh, believe me, the <laughs> you can't get a wind farm here, you can't get a wind farm anywhere. The, the um, government is actively looking at the liberated territories for the renewables and not just in, in solar and, uh, uh, and wind, but also heavily in, in the uh, hydroelectric power with the, with the mountainous areas, with the rivers, um, and also geothermal as well. They're very, very keen to, to push on with this. Um, but again, coming back, the occupied territories, I arrived here, as you said, I was 20, nearly 23 years now. I traveled Azerbaijan playing football. I saw the um, state, if you like, of the country at the time where it mm -hmm. collapsed under the, the problems of the, the, uh, of the war with Armenia originally, but also the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the opportunity, therefore, to just rebuild is incredible, absolutely incredible. And the need for the expertise to do this properly is also very, very, very important and, and, and accessible. There's not many countries where you can just come in, for example, the internet, and just drop the internet in. You don't have to dig up anything necessarily because there's nothing to dig up. You just go and put it in. So this is the great advantage, I think, of, uh, of where Azerbaijan is quite right now. Uh, and the big, big push on it is going to be the likes of BP, who in 2019, I think, invested $23 billion into Azerbaijan in the oil industry. Um, they're going to have a, a, a dramatic effect and a dramatic change in how they're going to be doing business in what is currently their main source of revenue that they this is where bp make a substantial amount of their money and pretty much actually it's probably kept them going oh and thank me maybe but it's helped them with their uh, cash flow without any shadow of a doubt um so yes the 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 change is there and the government's ready for it um the legislation is ready to go to make the, the use of the uh, renewable energy, so it comes onto the grid, as it were. Um, they're ready for it. The reforms have been basically put in place and they just need to be rubber stamped now, which is, um, we feel, ready to happen at any point. Thank you so much. And thank you especially, John, for, for painting that uh, visual image for us um, as to the geography and the climate and the landscape of Azerbaijan. Uh, many of us uh, on, this, uh, on this call come from a variety of different geographies. Some may have been, some may have not been uh, previously to, uh, to Azerbaijan. I had the opportunity to spend a bit of time in Baku last, last year. Um, but for those who have not, you've really helped to bring to life what's going on there. Um, something else that emerges from your commentary, uh, I think is really striking, which is that uh, these uh, policies that are changing the ways in which energy companies are thinking about innovation and bringing in expertise into Azerbaijan. 
Uh, historically, we would think of these uh, environmental policies as coming from a, uh, a, a public sector or, or a, a government policy. Now we're seeing that amplified, that movement amplified by pressure on the corporate board and on the private sector actually to develop new economies. And so that's really, it seems going to compound the impact of diversification uh, in a country like Azerbaijan in the next 10 years. Um, you've spoken quite a bit, of course, about the land and the geography. And that brings us into another sector that Movlin touched on very, very briefly in your, in your opening remarks, um, which is on uh, agriculture. Uh, the floor is open, of course, for questions. And one of the questions that has come in to me uh, is, is, on, um, is on agriculture. How is it that uh, agriculture um, innovation and the ag sector, can you just, uh, Moflin, initially give us that, that big picture perspective on where agriculture fits within the, uh, the Azeri economy? And then perhaps, um, John, you can, uh, you can go into that a bit further. I know you've spoken to me about that a bit before. So Moflin, can you take us there first? Sure. Um, yes, it is one of the big bets for the country. In fact, if you look at, just to give you an example of um, uh, how much we export of agriculture, just in Russia, it's uh, something about $1 billion of the agricultural products exported every year. That's significant. Um, so, but uh, the, as we diversify the industries of the economy, the, um, the, the <clears throat> The, the country also said, okay, they want to diversify uh, its, uh, its, its supply, supplies to the other countries as well. So I think there's a great opportunity. Obviously, transportation, that comes hand in hand with transportation and logistics uh, because we need to actually improve uh, that, the, um, our access to the world markets. At the moment, uh, at the moment, the Azerbaijan is part of the number of the various regional uh, transportation projects uh, like a uh, with China, then the, around the Caucasus, and also with Turkey and so on. So I think that should give us the new stimulus for uh, importing uh, more agricultural products. Um, in terms of actually the specifics, uh, because it's, it's, it's one of the strategic areas for the country, um, there's been a number of the reforms done. First, there's a new minister, actually, he's not that new, he's, he's been a couple of years young, very very energetic person I know him personally, uh, who's done a, who's done a gr number of the great reforms in his previous posts. Then the agriculture is pretty much fully exempt from the taxation, um, so that actually gives also uh, some good subsidy for the uh, for 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 that particular area. So actually, I'll stop here. I can talk quite a lot about this. Maybe um, maybe John or Robert they might have uh, their own insight into this area. Well, perhaps I can bring John in and then, um, and then Ambassador Sakuda. We've had a few questions related to China, so I'm going to be kicking the ball back into your, your court shortly. Um, but John, just to pick up where Movlin left off specifically on the, the agriculture point, um, something I very much remember from we, when we first met was your description of the tomatoes being one of the biggest crops in Azerbaijan. I personally come from Sacramento, California, uh, where our nickname is Sacra Tomato. We're some of the biggest tomato growers as well. Um, so that, that definitely stuck with me. Um, you sitting there looking at the Azerbaijan uh, or the, the, the British Azerbaijan um, uh, business uh, group, what, what are you doing to start to anticipate, uh, you know, the, the startup environment in agriculture technology or attract some of the big names? Is this something that you guys are thinking about or how are you looking to foster innovation in, in this particular sector? And Azerbaijan is one of the fastest growing sectors in the country. Um. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, at the same time with the, the renewable webinar, webinar we did yesterday, the, the British Embassy actually did their own one aimed at agriculture. Um, the point about renewables is, is that the infrastructure and ability to um, take it forward is actually in Azerbaijan because all of the oil service companies, oil and gas companies, they have the infrastructure and the ability to just start building wind farms and stuff like that. It's the engineering capability is there. But in the agriculture sector, um, as I spoke to you about it, and the point about playing football all over the place was the agriculture I could see at the time, so we're going 22 years ago, there was very, very little um, modern agricultural techniques and very, very little modern uh, technological um, innovation of any kind going back only you know, 20 years ago. 
Um, now, since the change uh, and certain areas of Azerbaijan, there has been investment into the agricultural um, industries and, and improvements in how to get uh, a better yield or a better um, uh, produce. However, it's not um, been perhaps the, the most, um, the policy on it has perhaps not been quite there. So the ability for countries, especially in a way like the United Kingdom where, um, not to get political, but where the EU policies sort of stopped our ability to farm perhaps where we wanted to, mm. but this expertise is, is seen quite often because we now got some British experts here, we got Dutch experts here, and they're all working on different parts of the agriculture. Um, which you can then bring in winemaking and you can bring in like hazelnuts, which I think is the third largest export um, currently. Um, but the ability, therefore, to expand the agricultural market is absolutely huge. There's about uh, nine different climatic zones in uh, Azerbaijan. This is really quite something where you don't normally get, um, you know, it, like in the UK, it's just rain, you know, but for Azerbaijan, you, you've got mountainous areas, you, you've got desert, which is Baku, um, you've got all these different areas and therefore the ability to grow different crops, um, uh, a, a different livestock and all the rest of it is there. And therefore the potential of it is huge in that regard. Uh, and just coming back again, I mean, 20 years ago, there was 8 million people lived in Azerbaijan. Well, 20 years later, there's 10 million. That's a really fast growing population. And it also, A, needs to be fed, but B, um, it's going to continue to grow. And a growing population is also one of the big driving factors in a growing economy. So in terms of agriculture, um, yeah, we're reaching out now to the Brits to see if they want to come out and have a look um, and, and move on because the ability is there. Whereas say 20 years ago, there was no ability to come here and be a big agricultural producer because the infrastructure wasn't there. Now it is. Thank you. So we're, we are getting, um, we, we've discussed the, the future of energy. We've discussed the future of agriculture as being another sector that's growing. Um, let's come back now quickly into the ways in which that the, the foreign policy landscape is impacting the future of the economy. So Ambassador Sakuda, back, back over to you. We've had quite a few uh, chats coming through in our questions uh, about, about China. Um, the fact that Azerbaijan sits in that East meet, meets West territory. Everyone is talking about what, uh, what Boris Johnson's approach to China is going to be post-Brexit, what the Biden administration's uh, approach is going to be. You mentioned that a number of the major infrastructure projects are actually uh, funded by Azerbaijan, um, which perhaps um, changes the way in which we view Chinese involvement. But can you help us understand that uh, relationship between the Chinese uh, economy and investment in the region and how that applies to Azerbaijan specifically? And I know you maybe wanted to make a couple of remarks on uh, agriculture as well. Uh, so why don't you cover off on both of those two topics and then we're going to shift into some advice that you would give for companies looking to invest. So Ambassador Zakud, over to you. Okay, thanks. And I guess being a New Yorker is good. I can talk faster to try to cram more information in, although it won't be understandable to anybody except another New Yorker. Um, first, just a couple of things. I do want to say a couple of things on ag, and I think this actually is sort of one of the points where the US government's been involved. We've had a very active aid program on agriculture. Um, I've had conversations, and I think I can say this in, um, with the president, of Azerbaijan, where we sat down and we talked about drip, agri drip irrigation. Um, the top levels of the government are very focused on developing agriculture and developing the quality of product. Um, with USAID, we did a lot of work on pomegranates. We did a lot of work on, on hazelnuts. These sound kind of wonky, um, but if you've ever had Nutella, you know that uh, there is a company out there that uses huge quantities of hazelnuts. So it's an important crop. Um, and living now in the United States where I pay $3.50 for one pomegranate. Um, I used to tell my, you know, Azerbaijani friends, you've got an export market. I know you're from California, so I will, I will be, you know, I will hold back on my New Yorker charm. Um, 
But coming back again, I think this, this question of China is an important one. Um, the, and I thought saw this in the chat, as someone noted, Azerbaijan is the only country in the world which borders Russia and Iran. Um, if we were thinking in terms of sea lanes, Azerbaijan would be a critical strait because you can't get east-west across Eurasia unless you want to go through Russia or you want to go through Iran uh, without going through Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan and Georgia together form a key bridge. And now I think with the, um, with the ceasefire and hopefully a movement towards peace, maybe even Armenia can grow into this. That's getting a little ahead of ourselves right now. But the reality is that for all the BRI projects, or for the BRI projects, um, for the, the, the access east-west across Eurasia, Azerbaijan is a key piece. Um, China has had a strong interest, I think, in Azerbaijan, but it's been different. Um, and again, as I noted, Azerbaijan's oil wealth and its talents have enabled it to do things that other countries in that region have not. And so that's helped safeguard them from some of the problems that some other countries have had with some, of, with some and I'm underlining some, of their Chinese investments. As far as I think one of the questions everybody has is what's the Biden administration going to do? Um, I can't speak to that. Um, yeah, I think the Biden administration is you know, coming in, uh, as anybody who's ever read a newspaper will know, with a lot of different challenges coming at it. This is, 2020 has been a challenging year for everybody. Um, but I think one of the things you know, that is very much on the minds of the, of the incoming administration as the current administration is the changing attitudes, the changing actions of China. And in that regard, we've seen in the United States um, moves to establish now the new Development Finance Corporation. Um, this used to be known as OPIC, um, that always caused confusion with OPEC but OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, this is now the Development Finance Corporation, DFC, is able to take capital positions in emerging market countries that it couldn't before. And it's strongly interested in countries like Azerbaijan. It's strongly interested in developing energy and, 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 and green energy and renewables. Um, we've worked with DFC on some of that stuff. Um, there's real potential on, on that front. And that's something which I think the a uh, new administration will probably continue with. There is strong interest in Congress on how, um, what kind of roles Russia and China are playing in the world. And so I think it's gonna continue to focus. It's gonna continue, I think, a focus in terms of agencies like DFC, like Exim, the Export Import Bank in the United States, um, in engagement in this part of the world. And I think that can be a help to business. Um, there's certainly potential there and certainly a desire on the U.S. government side to help encourage that, that progress. Um, the, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the rhetoric, but I think the, re the reality is one where um, there, is a, there, is a, there is an interest in, um, in this part of the world, in seeing it become more prosperous, keeping it stable protecting the independence and integrity of the countries of that region. And um, the Trump administration, one of the few foreign policy papers it put out was on Central Asia. Um, but you can't get to Central Asia without going through Azerbaijan. Yeah, it's part of the thing. So there is a focus in this part of the world. And I think a focus on the US side is going, is going to remain. Um, certainly developments um, with the Karabakh and, and the war with Armenia, I think that's also it opens new opportunities, uh, new, new avenues for engagement and some creativity. Yeah, this is certainly a reset uh, moment. And um, I know we have a very distinguished group of guests from a business perspective uh, today, but if your geography is not so good, this would be a very good time to get out a map uh, and ensure that you orient yourself into everything Ambassador Sakuda has just said in terms of where it is specifically that we're talking about in the world, where those borders lie and why this is such a critical um, part of our global economy to be paying attention to. We've had one question come in from, from one of our guests, Anthony Moncton, who um, runs a company advising corporates uh, on doing business in emerging markets, and uh, would be curious to hear the perspective of the, of the panelists on, if you were advising a company to come into uh, Azerbaijan, we've talked a lot about the opportunities, uh, what are the risks and what would be your advice on what companies, corporates can do to best navigate those risks 
uh, or, or get best in class advice to, to work through them. Uh, John, can I pass over to, to you? You work so much with biz foreign businesses coming in. What would be your best advice to somebody like Anthony to help corporates uh, navigate um, Azerbaijan effectively if they're just coming into the market? So, uh, Mughlan spoke about production sharing agreements before. So these are specifically aimed at the oil business. Um, and, and what they therefore do is they kind of protect the, the, the oil companies from uh, not the, the everyday regulation of Azerbaijan, but from uh, it, it gives it an international standard of law. And therefore, as an oil company or oil services company, it's slightly different. So we just I'll just move away from the oil completely. I think if you are an oil services company, you're probably very aware of all of this and and there's no need to sort of concern so much. I'd say perhaps that um, <laughs> if I started off and said, well, you need a good lawyer, uh, that would perhaps create the wrong impression. Um, but it's um, certainly important, I think, that uh, you understand that the, the legal system developed out of the Soviet Union where nobody owned anything. Uh, it didn't, you, know, you didn't even own the car. You were kind of given the car. You were given an apartment. That's where you lived. And so the last 20, 30 years, the country has kind of evolved its legal system. Um, it's changed its language from Russian to Azerbaijani. When I first arrived, everyone spoke Russian. Now, when you walk down the street, everybody you hear is speaking Azerbaijani. So there's little bits of confusion there. So you do need to understand um, the legal system without, without a doubt. And of course, you're not going to be able to just move in there straight away. So I would suggest that you basically, first of all, go and talk to um, the business communities, sort of like the British Business Group or AmCham, of which uh, Mughlan is, is involved with and that Robert uh, is sort of like a figurehead, if you like. Um, the Germans have a very good chamber as well the Italians are there uh, and therefore I would go down that route follow them through with the professional services companies of which you've got all of the the major ones uh, uh, there and then you've got say the British uh, particular ones like the BDOs of this world that are there too so it's not quite as big but they can all provide you with that so the support for that I think is number one just to understand that there are are things that you need to do and then also if you want to open up business uh, in Azerbaijan, it's important that your, say, business partners, if you like, that you know who they are and you know that the who the ones are that you really ought to be getting involved in into the particular uh, sector that you want to go into, um, because it is very important to have the right people there um, to to help you to set up and to guide you in the way that you want to do it you're bringing your expertise but the local expertise is something that you cannot really do without so i think in in those things that's really what you need to uh, be aware of um and it's, it's not too difficult to find out where to go for certain uh, i don't believe and Mothlin, how about from your perspective, what advice would you offer? We have so many people that help companies understand new markets to go into. What advice would you give for uh, how it is that companies can best navigate? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, sure. Um, just a few more things to add to what John said. Um, firstly, uh, it, because all of these changes and transformation process going on, uh, it may be sometimes a little bit overwhelming to understand who does what and where the, the real power resides, yeah? So finding the right person, find the right decision maker these days might be a little bit difficult. Not, not, not difficult, but it might take some time. And as I said, it might be a little confusing. So identify the real decision maker and, uh, and deal with, with him or her, of course. Um, secondly, just to add uh, to what John said about having a good um, lawyer, that's absolutely true. But also I would say, have a good tax advisor or tax accountant, whatever, because the tax system here is evolving and the ministry, state tax service rather, is getting the more and more powers pretty much every day. So it is important that actually you have your tax 
and the accounting financial system in place done properly um, before you know they knock your door. Um, also, um, with, all, with also some of the changes that's happening in the procurement system and the laws, in fact, around the ATs and everything, it's important for you to have a proper vendor in whatever you do, yeah? Um, because now, in, in, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be legalistic now, but it's, in fact, if your vendor makes a mistake, genuine or intentional or, or fraud, whatever, it actually might become your problem. That's the way the current legislation has been designed to sort of a, to to, uh, to tackle the, the fraud issue that happened many years, especially in the VAT area. So that's important that you do a proper due diligence on your vendor. Um, the and the, the other point is human resources uh, with with a lot more opportunities for people. Over, even in these circumstances of a pandemic, the post-war, still it's very difficult to find the good resources. Uh, that are kind of like in a middle level. It's, 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 it's relatively, there are a lot of good, very young, young people who are very enthusiastic, speak English, and they're, they're happy to do, to, to work. Um, and, uh, but it's, it, sometimes it may be difficult to find sort of middle level, those who would call them managers, who own the projects and actually who lead the projects. So that actually also be important that you to identify the right people, which, which may be challenging. And the last one is patience <laughs> in this time. Uh, really having the, the you know the, having the, some patience in you know, navigating the way through the the maze of all the changes legislative or the governmental changes it's uh it it it, it will take some time i guess but but it's worth it for sure lots of uh lots of change uh happening always leaves uh opportunities um as well to create new policies that work better for the 21st century, uh, frankly, I think so many uh, policies in the industrialized and developed you know, world, the challenge is you have to deal with the old policies while you're also uh, creating the, the, the new ones. Um, we're uh, coming up uh, on, on getting into the, the final questions before I'm going to actually pose a, uh, a parting thought to, to each of our, our panelists. Um, but Ambassador Sakuda, if I could uh, come back to, to you, one sector we haven't talked about yet um, but is also a growing sector in Azerbaijan is, is tourism. Uh, during your years um, as ambassador, was, was tourism something that was definitely on your radar and what's happening today and in the next 10 years in terms of this, um, in terms of this sector in the country? Yeah, tourism definitely was. It's one of, those, uh, one of those sectors that the government really charted from the beginning as having potential for um, increasing employment, increasing opportunities, increasing growth, and diversifying the economy away from the heavy dependence on hydrocarbon production. Um, I will just say personally, um, I you know, wasn't there as long as John, but, um, or, or surely Mafon, but um, I made a point of trying to travel around the country and see it. I felt as ambassador, it's very easy to get caught up in the diplomatic life in the capital, certain official meetings and so forth, but to be out. And as a result, I made it through most of the country, still parts I didn't see. But one of the things which I was impressed by, um, actually early on, was being up in Shaki, up in the northern part, which is, um, is a beautiful, I think it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, uh, palace that was built by one of the Khans um, that's really well worth seeing. Um, we were in a small hotel, and there was a group of, of, I think, retired German tourists there. And I thought this was really good because this is, it was not just sort of the high-end tourists, um, but people who were interested in seeing something different. And I think there's a strong market for that in parts of this world. I mean, I realize right now everything is all messed up because of COVID. Um, but, you know, this will end. Um, and we will be sort of back up and going, but there really is tremendous potential for tourism. Um, the Azerbaijanis, frankly, are very hospitable. Um, they want you to see their country. They want you to eat their food. They want to sort of, you know, welcome you. And this makes for a good, I think, tourist experience. Um, my kids enjoyed skiing up in Shadakh, um, up in the northern part of the country. It's a beautiful resort up there. Um, one of the things which they liked was no real lines. Now, of course, tourism starts really developing, those lines will come, but um, that's a nice thing to have. Um, and I think that now, too, with the situation, you know, sort of moved to a different, uh, you know, with a ceasefire, um, you've got other parts of the country which eventually will be opened up. I mean, we have 
I know traditionally uh, Garabach was one of the places that his Rajanis went for, for, for travel. So I would be interested to see it. Obviously, I could never go there when I was ambassador, but um, there is great potential. Um, there are a lot of the international, um, um, international big hotel chains are there. But I think there's a lot of potential, I think, sort of for not just the five star, but sort of, you know, the solid three star. Um, my own experience of living in Central Europe um, with, uh, with Germany and Austria was that a lot of people, particularly when they retired, were very interested in going someplace nobody else had been. And I think Azerbaijan could be very good on that point. It's not that far away. It's safe. It's interesting and very, very enjoyable. Mm. We have, we have one more question that's come through um, for you, Ambassador Sakuda, on the diplomatic front. Um, before I pose that question, I am going to give John and Movland a heads up as to my parting question for you all so you can get thinking. Um, we're coming up, of course, to the end of the year, and many of us will be writing our uh, personal New Year's resolutions. <laughs> if you could write a New Year's resolution on behalf of Azerbaijan uh, for 2021, what, what would it be? And we would love for you to share that with us. So while the two of you think about your response, Ambassador Sakuda, I'm going to come back to you. Um, we've spent a bit of time talking about U.S. We've spent a bit of time talking about China and, of course, the general uh, or the, the, the local region uh, close to Azerbaijan. But we haven't yet hit on Brussels and relationships with, um, with Europe. Do you have any commentary, especially given you know, the, the history, the former Soviet history, which our, uh, which our, um, uh, our guest is particularly interested in, uh, given that history, is there sufficient relationship building going on um, between Baku and, and Brussels or Baku and, and Europe? I would say yes. Uh, my my uh, two colleagues, uh, two counterparts, um, is EU represents EU ambassadors, and I was there and worked with whom I worked very closely and were absolutely top rate. Um, and I think there is, a, there is a strong interest in, in Brussels in terms of the EU in relations with Azerbaijan. There's also, I think, it, it varies in some cases by some of the countries within the EU. Uh, Italy has a very deep uh, interest in the energy side of things. Um, France is a member of the co-chairs. Uh, uh, Poland and the Eastern Bloc, uh, the, the, I'm giving away my age, um, the, the, uh, the, the Eastern members of the, of the EU have historical connections with, with Baku. Um, a number of them are interested in using this new, these new east-west transportation routes. Um, relations might not be the greatest between Ukraine, no, it's not you, but uh, Ukraine and Moscow or Poland and Moscow. Um, and so to move goods to Kazakhstan, for example, but, or things from Kazakhstan or, or, or further east, um, that requires using that these new routes, these expanding routes through the port at a lot in the road system, the rail system that's being built and, and modernized in Azerbaijan. Um, again, I think there's a, there's an interest uh, in terms of the, the the health and well-being of that part of the world, and I think there's also I think an awareness, and this is one thing that COVID brought home to us: we are all connected. Borders are you know, don't really stop certain things. And so we have to work together. Um, and I think that's something that the EU very much understands and, you know, it, it is, is active with Azerbaijan. Um, it's interesting, while you have strong EU missions, you also have strong EU member state embassies in Baku. And that's a sign, I think, of the commitment, uh, the interest on the part of the UK, of France, of Spain, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, keep Austria, keep on going there, um, in um, maintaining a relationship, in knowing what's going on, in engaging um, on a commercial front. So yeah, um, I'm not the not, not the EU ambassador, but I hope I I, I you know, was able to um, speak in a friendly way for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we're coming up on our last um, five minutes and you touched there on just how many lessons we've learned from COVID in 2020. And I personally believe that 2021 to 2031 is going to be one of the most exciting decades that any of us will, will witness because we have had an opportunity to really take this year to have a, have a reset and, and rethink um, what really matters, what's important, what our priorities are, um, both personally but also professionally. 
And so with that, I'm going to come to the three of you with your resolution. Uh, what would be your New Year's resolution for Azerbaijan 2021 as we un enter the last few weeks of this year? Uh, John, I'll start with you. Quite a simple one, really. Could you just give us a year off? And, <laughs> nothing and just let us get on with it, please. No COVID, no war, no nothing. Let's just go to work. <laughs> John, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hear whether you're talking about Azerbaijan or the United States of America. I think, I think many Americans would have exactly the same New Year's resolution uh, after our election year. Thank you for that. Um, Movlin, how about you? What's your New Year's resolution for Azerbaijan 2021? Uh, Azerbaijan has had this ambition for a long time to be a regional hub for uh, Eurasia and Central Asia. And in fact, uh, it, I, I think this is probably 2021 might be the perfect opportunity, in fact, to do that. So I really would like for the country to start what I call a spiritualize the borders. So with the peace, with the peace that is coming to the region, hopefully with the resolving number of the longstanding issues that we've had with our neighbors, I think that's the time when we start removing those borders and start and working even closer, not, not only with the Caucasus, but also with Central Asia on the eastern part of the region, so to become a truly leader of the region. So borders basically based on ideas, cooperation, collective security. So, Regional, regional leadership, excellent, yes. yes. And uh, it would be, well, we're, we're just about out of time, but it would be so wonderful at a future stage to hear uh, what those themes would be, what, what would you suggest would be on the agenda of that, re uh, of that regional leadership. Perhaps we can pick that up in a future session. There would be a lot for us to unpack in, in that agenda if you were to host the first meeting amongst leader, uh, regional, regional players. Uh, Ambassador Sakuda, your New Year's resolution for Azerbaijan 2021? I think it would be to try to figure out how to take advantage of all of the challenges uh, that have come from COVID. Um, I think the real thing, and it's not just for right now, it's for the U.S. as well, other countries, but we don't have to go back to the way things were. Let's, re, you know, to quote someone who just got elected in the United States, let's build back better. And I think that there's real potential to sort of just say, all right, we don't have to do what we did. Let's do what we let's do what we want and do, do new things that we can. Um, but I'm kind of with John. Um, actually, I, uh, I know people who basically said your birthdays this year don't count because this, this year should just be kind of forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Um, I'm afraid that we're um, coming up now on the top of the hour, but it's been absolutely wonderful to hear uh, from all three of you. And we really do thank you for, for your time and giving us the hour today. Thank you so much for everyone joining us from around the world for all of your questions. Um, we've traveled through a number of geographies and a number of industries. We've touched on startups. We've touched on big business throughout the course of the last hour. Uh, there's still more to be discussed, but of course, as always, uh, you're more than welcome to get in touch with uh, Simon uh, and Jessica at Forum or myself uh, to follow up and pick up further themes and ideas um, to unpack as we move forward. So thank you all so very much. Simon, did you have anything final to, uh, to remark before we wrap up? Only to thank you, Elizabeth, for hosting a very interesting hour. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you all again in the new year. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All Wish the you very the best. best Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Have good holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.